in the heart of the remote Cascade Mountains, there's a stretch of wilderness few people dare to enter. Seasoned hikers call it the Wound, named for its endless cliffs, treacherous ravines, and dark pines that block out the sun. Local legends tell of twisted creatures lurking within, and for park ranger Lucas Carver, these stories were just part of the lore he heard from tourists and locals alike. That was until he encountered something in the wound that haunted him for the rest of his life. It was late autumn when Lucas received a call about an abandoned campsite deep in the woods. The location was near an area few ventured into, particularly so close to winter. Days were short, and the sky hung heavy with the promise of snow. Lucas was a 15-year veteran ranger, sturdy and unshakable, but when he heard the location, he felt a slight chill. He packed his gear, radioed in his location, and set out on the trail alone, as most of his team had already clocked out. He reached the site by dusk. The forest was so thick that even at this hour it was nearly pitch black. The trees groaned in the wind and silence wrapped around the area, disturbed only by the occasional skittering of unseen creatures. The campsite itself was eerie. Two empty tents with belongings still inside, but no sign of the campers. Blankets were thrown aside, a canister of soup lay half-opened by the fire pit, and a flashlight lay in the dirt, its beam piercing the darkness. Lucas radioed in, but the connection crackled with static. He caught a faint voice before it cut out entirely. Lucas? Don't go. Wow. Wound. He tried again, but the line was dead. With a sinking feeling, he looked around the darkening woods, wondering if his co-workers were playing a prank. But the isolation pressed against him, making his skin prickle. He was alone, far from anyone who could help. Just then, a sound, a long, drawn-out moan, echoed through the trees. It was low, almost like a human voice, but twisted, as if struggling to form words. Lucas's flashlight beam whipped toward the sound, but there was nothing there. The moaning came again, closer this time, and he felt a rush of cold air against his neck. He crouched low, his breath shallow, straining to hear. The moan shifted, almost musical, twisting into an odd rhythm that sent shivers down his spine. As he listened, the tone shifted to mimic something. No. Someone. Lass. The whisper was so close that he spun around, almost losing his balance. The flashlight flickered, its beam revealing nothing but an expanse of trees and shadows. Suddenly, he heard a scraping sound in the underbrush, then the crack of a branch. He swung his light wildly, the beam catching on a glint of eyes just above ground level. They were too wide, too large, and glowing a dull yellow. Whatever it was, it was watching him. The eyes stared at him, unblinking, before disappearing into the blackness. But then they appeared again, higher this time, as if the creature had risen on two legs. Lucas's heart pounded as he slowly backed away, stepping over twigs and leaves that crunched louder than they should have in the silence. The thing moved closer, its shape just outside the edge of his flashlight's reach. He could barely make out long, sinewy limbs and a face too distorted to be human, yet disturbingly familiar, like a nightmarish mask mimicking a person. It whispered again, its voice dripping with mockery. Lou, Cass, come closer. He broke into a run, the beam of his flashlight dancing through the trees as he fled. The creature moved in sync with him, its low moans echoing his own panicked breaths. The trees seemed to close in, branches clawing at his jacket as he tried to navigate the winding, overgrown paths. Lucas sprinted through the dark until he tripped over something soft, falling hard onto the forest floor. He rolled, shining his flashlight to see what had caused him to stumble. His breath caught in his throat. It was a body, half buried in the underbrush, one of the campers, his eyes wide and unseeing, his mouth frozen open in an expression of horror. Lucas scrambled backward, this for us, half his hands tangling in the leaves. Before he could even process the scene, he heard that awful whisper, closer than ever. Lucas, don't leave. He looked up and saw the creature looming over him, standing unnaturally tall, its head cocked at a strange angle. The face, a grotesque mask of stretched flesh and hollow eyes, mimicked his own. The creature's mouth twisted into a sick smile. It crouched down inches from his face, and he felt its cold breath against his cheek. In a desperate move, Lucas reached for his bear spray, fumbling with the cap before managing to spray it directly at the creature. The smell of the pepper filled his nose as he forced himself to his feet, but when he looked back, the thing was gone. He didn't wait to see if it would return. 
He bolted back through the forest, guided only by faint moonlight and sheer instinct. His legs ached, his lungs burned, but he didn't stop until he saw the ranger station lights in the distance, their soft glow like a lifeline in the dark. Inside, Lucas collapsed onto the floor, gasping for air. His co-workers rushed over, their concerned faces blurring in his vision. He tried to explain what he saw, but his words tumbled out incoherently. They chalked it up to exhaustion and shock, and no one believed his story about the thing in the woods. But Lucas knew the truth. The wound had shown him something he could never unsee. He never went back to that part of the forest, and within a month he left his job altogether, moving far away from the Cascades. Local legends grew around his story, and over time, people claimed they too saw a strange figure in those woods, mimicking voices, twisting its shape, waiting for those foolish enough to wander too far in. Story number two. In the shadowed heart of North Cascades National Park, veteran park ranger Daniel Weber had seen it all. Bears, avalanches, and lost hikers were part of the job, but every ranger knew of the deep woods, a remote sector so dense and forbidding that maps only loosely outlined its boundaries. Rumor had it, a strange creature lurked there. Locals called it the Hollow Stag. Though mostly rumors, Daniel had heard disturbing tales, twisted antlers the size of tree limbs, a hollowed chest like a deep, gaping wound, and an unholy shriek that echoed through the valleys. Some hikers went in and never came out. The tales fed the mystique, but Daniel knew most were just stories to scare rookies, or so he thought, until the night he saw it for himself. One October evening, Daniel got a call that two campers were missing near the deep woods. As he loaded his supplies, his junior ranger, Ben, approached with wide eyes. Think it's the hollow stag? Ben asked, half joking, but with a tremor in his voice. Ghost stories won't find them, Daniel muttered, dismissing Ben's concerns. Grab your gear. They set out just before dusk, their flashlights cutting weak beams through the gathering fog. The deeper they went, the more the forest seemed to change. The trees grew thicker and taller, and the air was damp and stale. All sounds, birds, bugs, even the wind, seemed to fade, leaving an unsettling silence. After hours of searching, that Daniel spotted a dim glow through the trees. Look he whispered, motioning to Ben. They found a small campfire still burning, but the campsite was deserted. Two sleeping bags lay unzipped, their contents spilling out as though someone had left in a hurry. Daniel knelt to inspect the ground, finding faint footprints that led deeper into the woods. Oddly, beside them were larger impressions, almost like hooves, but twisted with sharp edges that gouged the soil. What do you think could make tracks like that? Ben asked, his voice strained. Not sure. Daniel replied, frowning, but whatever it is, it's big. They pressed on, following the trail as the forest grew darker and more ominous. Then, from somewhere deep within, they heard a low, unnatural moan, a sound that was neither animal nor human. It rose to a shriek so piercing that Ben stumbled, clutching his ears. What? What was that? He stammered, his face pale. Daniel shook his head, as unable to answer. They resumed their search, though every instinct screamed to turn back. The path twisted in impossible ways, leading them through ancient trees whose roots seemed to pulse underfoot. Shadows flickered on the edge of their vision, and strange shapes twisted in the fog, gone the instant they looked. Finally, they found a clearing. In the center was an enormous tree, gnarled and blackened as if struck by lightning. Its bark was carved with symbols. Strange, looping designs that Daniel had never seen before. Hanging from the branches were the camper's belongings, like trophies, a jacket, a hat, a broken flashlight, all swaying in the breeze. But what really froze Daniel's blood was the set of antlers tangled in the branches, massive and twisted, with what looked like patches of fur still clinging to them. A sickly stench hung in the air, and the fog seemed to thicken, swirling around them. Then, in the clearing's shadows, they saw it, the hollow stag. Its body was a grotesque parody of a deer, impossibly tall with twisted limbs and antlers so massive they seemed to scrape the tree branches above. Where its chest should have been, there was only a gaping void, black and hollow as if it were swallowing the night itself. It turned toward them, and its face was wrong, horribly wrong. Eyes like two burning coals locked onto Daniel's. The creature opened its mouth, but instead of a roar, a chorus of voices spilled out, each one filled with terror and despair echoing like a nightmare chorus. They were human voices, men, women, and children, all crying out in agony. 
Run, Daniel yelled, snapping out of his trance. He grabbed Ben's arm, pulling him back the way they had come. But the forest had changed. The trail they'd taken had disappeared, leaving only dense, suffocating trees in every direction. The hollow stag's cries grew louder, echoing through the trees as though it were everywhere at once. As they stumbled through the underbrush, the creature pursued them, its twisted hooves, crunching leaves, and snapping branches. The darkness around them seemed to pulse and throb, closing in tighter with every step. Daniel could feel its eyes burning into his back, feel the weight of its presence bearing down on him. Finally, they burst out of the trees and onto an old, overgrown road. Daniel pulled Ben forward, and they sprinted along the road until they could barely breathe. When they finally stopped to catch their breath, they looked back, but the hollow stag was gone. Yet the forest wasn't silent. Far in the distance, they heard its hollow, echoing wail, a warning that it still lingered, watching, waiting. By the time they returned to the ranger station, dawn was breaking, casting weak light over the haunted forest. The campers were never found, their campsite abandoned just like they had left it. And though Daniel filed his report and tried to convince himself it was just another tale, he knew better. Every so often, Daniel would find himself back in the woods at night, watching, listening. And on certain nights, when the fog was thick and the wind was low, he swore he could hear it, the faint, hollow cry of the stag echoing through the dark. Story number three. David Winters was no ordinary park ranger. For nearly 20 years, he had patrolled the stretches of Blackwood National Forest, a dense wilderness that spanned hundreds of miles. There were stories about the forest, tales of campers who vanished without a trace, and animals found mutilated in unnatural ways. When asked, David would wave them off as urban legends. But in truth, he knew there were things in the woods that didn't belong on any map. And the forest had rules. Rules you followed if you wanted to make it out alive. Um, David's shift usually ended before sundown, but this evening was different. A hiker named Tom Grayson had gone missing after setting out alone. He hadn't checked back in for over two days, and no one had seen or heard from him. So David, along with a rookie ranger named Eric, was dispatched to search the deeper parts of the forest, the places even seasoned outdoorsmen dared not tread. The two rangers drove down a dirt trail in an old creaky jeep, the trees pressing in tight around them. As the sun dipped below the horizon, the forest grew eerily quiet. No chirping insects, no rustling leaves, just the crunch of their tires on the forest floor. David didn't like it. Blackwood might have been old and strange, but it was never silent. I've never seen it this dead before, Eric muttered, looking out the window. David grunted. It gets like that sometimes. It means something's moving through. Like a bear? David didn't respond. He kept his eyes forward, gripping the wheel tightly. They weren't looking for a bear. He had a hunch, one that gnawed at the back of his mind, that whatever was out there had something to do with Tom's disappearance. They parked the jeep near the trailhead and armed themselves with flashlights and rifles. As they stepped into the forest, David made sure Eric stayed close. He told the rookie about the rules. No splitting up. No making too much noise. And if you hear footsteps behind you, don't look back. They hiked for over an hour, moving deeper into the forest than most rangers ever dared. The trees thickened, their branches clawing at the sky. The trail beneath them began to twist and turn in confusing ways, as if the forest was shifting to keep them lost. Soon, they reached a clearing, bare earth with no signs of plant life. David scanned the area, his flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. That's when he saw it. At the far end of the clearing, standing half concealed by the trees, was a figure. It was tall, too tall to be human, and its limbs were elongated and wrong, bending at unnatural angles. Its skin was gray and tight, like it had been stretched over a frame of bones. It had no eyes, just dark pits where they should have been, and yet David felt it watching them. Eric, David whispered, his voice tight with fear. We need to go. Now. But Eric had already raised his flashlight toward the creature. The beam struck the figure, and for a brief second, David swore it smiled, an impossibly wide grin filled with jagged teeth. Run! David barked, yanking Eric by the arm. They sprinted back toward the trail, the heavy thud of footsteps following them. But the thing behind them didn't sound like it was running. Instead, it moved with a strange rhythmic stride, as if it knew it didn't need to hurry. David resisted the urge to look back, 
knowing that doing so would only make things worse. They burst through the undergrowth and stumbled back onto the trail, panting hard. For a moment, the forest fell silent again, as if the thing had stopped chasing them. But David knew better. It was never gone, just waiting. We stick together, David said, trying to keep his voice steady. Stay on the trail. No matter what we hear, we don't stop. They kept moving, but the forest seemed determined to trap them. The path twisted in ways David didn't recognize, leading them deeper into the woods instead of toward the jeep. The trees whispered in the wind, soft, mournful voices that sounded almost human. Eric began to panic. This isn't right, he shouted. The trail, this shouldn't be here. David grabbed him by the shoulders. Calm down, we can't lose our heads. That's what it wants. What what wants? Eric demanded, eyes wide with terror. David didn't answer. He didn't need to. They both knew the answer was somewhere out there, waiting for them to slip up. The night stretched on, an endless maze of darkness and fear. At one point, they came across something horrifying. Tom Grayson's backpack, torn to shreds and covered in a dark, sticky substance that could only be blood. There were no signs of Tom himself, just his belongings scattered across the ground like a grim reminder. Then came the sounds. Footsteps in the distance, circling them, closing in. Not the heavy thud of a human or animal, but something far more deliberate like claws dragging across wood. Eric gripped his rifle tighter, his hands trembling. We need to get out of here, he whispered. We will, David assured him, though he wasn't sure if it was true. The forest didn't like letting people go. As they pressed on, the thing that had been chasing them grew bolder. Faint whispers drifted on the wind, calling their names, luring them off the trail. At one point, David thought he saw Tom in the distance, standing between two trees, waving them toward him. But he knew better. It wasn't Tom. It was something wearing his face. Don't follow it, David warned. It's not real. Eric nodded, though his face was pale with fear. The two rangers kept moving, but the forest seemed determined to trap them. Hours passed, or maybe it was only minutes, until they finally heard something familiar. The distant hum of the jeep's engine. Relief flooded David's chest. They were close. But just as they reached the clearing where the jeep was parked, David heard a voice behind him, a low, rasping whisper that sent chills down his spine. David, you can't leave. For the first time in years, David made the mistake of looking back. And that's when he saw it. The figure from before, now standing only feet away, its grin impossibly wide. David shoved Eric toward the jeep. Get in! Go! Eric scrambled into the vehicle and started the engine, but David hesitated for a split second, just long enough for the thing to lunge. Its clawed hands swiped at him, tearing through his jacket as he dove into the passenger seat. Eric slammed on the gas, and the jeep roared to life, speeding down the trail. They didn't stop until they were miles from the forest, the sun beginning to rise on the horizon. Both men sat in stunned silence, their hearts pounding in their chests. What the hell was that? Eric finally whispered, his voice trembling. David shook his head, his hands still shaking. I don't know, but whatever it was, it's still out there. And deep in the forest, among the shadows and ancient trees, the thing watched as the jeep disappeared from sight. It smiled that awful, jagged grin, because it knew. No one ever really leaves Blackwood. Story number four. In the shadowy depths of the Appalachians, there was a park known for its labyrinthine trails, towering old-growth trees, and an ever-present mist that hung low over the mountains. The locals called it Haunted Hollow, a nickname earned from strange disappearances and the eerie sounds that often echoed through the hills at night. The ranger who patrolled these woods, Tom Walker, had heard all the rumors, but he was a practical man. He didn't buy into ghost stories or cryptid tales. But his skepticism shattered on a dark autumn night that would haunt him forever. Tom had been working a late shift, following up on a report of strange lights seen near the hollow's oldest trail, the Devil's Spine. Fog rolled through the trees in thick silvery sheets, swallowing up the beam of his flashlight. The radio on his belt crackled, barely audible through the heavy static. He'd tried calling back to the station for backup, but the signal was all but dead. So Tom had no choice but to continue alone trudging deeper into the mist-covered woods. As he moved along the trail, a sudden, unnatural silence fell. It wasn't the comforting quiet of the forest, where leaves rustle and animals scurry. This was an oppressive, suffocating silence, as if every creature in the woods had vanished. 
Tom slowed his pace, senses alert, scanning his surroundings. Shadows loomed in every direction, twisting and contorting as the mist shifted around him. Then he saw it, a flickering light up ahead, barely visible through the dense fog. Tom crept closer, his flashlight held high. The light grew stronger, a pale, ghostly glow illuminating the outline of an old cabin. But Tom knew there shouldn't be any cabin out here. He'd patrolled these woods for years and had never seen it before. Despite every instinct telling him to turn back, Tom moved toward the structure. The cabin was dilapidated, its wooden walls gray and splintered, vines creeping up through the cracks. Inside, a faint light flickered, as though from a candle. He pushed the door open, and it creaked ominously, the sound echoing through the silent forest. The inside of the cabin was sparsely furnished. A broken table, an old rocking chair, and a mirror hanging on the wall. The candle on the table flickered, casting unsettling shadows. But what made Tom's blood run cold was what lay on the table beside it. A journal, bound in worn leather and covered in muddy fingerprints. He picked it up, flipping through the pages. Each entry was scrawled in shaky handwriting, detailing encounters with something inhuman. The writer described how they'd been stalked for days, hearing footsteps at night, glimpsing shapes in the trees. It mimics voices, one entry read, whispering my name in the dark. It knows I'm here. It won't let me leave. Tom slammed the journal shut, his heart pounding. The sound of his name, whispered in a raspy voice, drifted through the cabin. Tom? His breath caught as he turned, his flashlight beam sweeping over the room. There was nothing there, only his own shadow flickering on the wall. But the voice came again, closer this time, right by his ear. Tom. He stumbled backward, knocking the candle off the table. It extinguished with a hiss, plunging the cabin into darkness. Panic clawed at his mind as he turned, intending to flee, but froze. Standing in the doorway was a figure, tall, twisted, and utterly wrong. Its limbs were elongated, too thin, its face a pale, eyeless mask twisted into a horrific grin. Before he could scream, the figure moved, its hand reaching out with fingers as long and sharp as claws. Tom ran, crashing through the door and into the misty forest. He sprinted blindly, his only thought to get as far from the cabin as possible. But as he ran, he heard footsteps behind him, slow and deliberate, crunching through the leaves in perfect sync with his own. His heart hammered as he glanced back, catching a glimpse of the figure gliding through the trees, always a step behind. It moved like a shadow, silent and smooth, its grin widening as it watched him struggle. Tom's lungs burned, his legs feeling like lead, but he couldn't stop. The footsteps grew louder, echoing through the trees, matching his every move. Then, out of the mist, he saw the lights of the ranger station ahead, a beacon of hope piercing the darkness. He stumbled toward it, bursting through the door and collapsing inside. His fellow rangers crowded around him, bombarding him with questions, but Tom could barely speak, his words coming out in broken gasps. He tried to explain, to warn them about the figure in the woods, but they dismissed it as fatigue, the ramblings of a man who'd spent too many hours in the cold, misty forest. Over the next few days, Tom's behavior changed. He refused to go near the woods, constantly looking over his shoulder, as if expecting something to emerge from the shadows. His co-workers grew concerned, especially when he began hearing his name called in empty rooms or catching glimpses of movement in mirrors. One night, his fellow ranger, Lisa, found him outside the station, staring into the woods. When she asked him what he was doing, he simply shook his head, muttering, it won't let me leave. She tried to bring him inside, but Tom resisted, his gaze fixed on something only he could see. The next morning, Tom was gone. His truck was still parked at the station, and his belongings were untouched. A search party scoured the forest, but no trace of him was found. Some rangers whispered that he had been taken by whatever haunted the woods, that the thing he'd seen in the cabin had come back to claim him. Months passed, and the memory of Tom Walker faded, his story becoming just another tale to scare rookies and tourists. But on quiet nights, when the mist rolled in, those who ventured too close to the devil's spine would sometimes hear a voice drifting through the trees, a desperate, echoing whisper calling out from somewhere deep within the haunted hollow. Help me, the voice would beg, sounding disturbingly like Tom's. Don't let it find you. Story number five. It was late fall, the park's quiet season, when Ranger Alex Monroe was assigned to check on the Old Creek Trail, 
Nestled deep in the dense forests of Glacier National Park, the trail had been shut down for years due to frequent landslides and treacherous conditions. Only seasoned rangers like Alex were sent there, and even then, only to ensure the barrier signs and fencing were intact. But recent reports of strange sightings, unusual animal prints, eerie lights, meant she had to trek in deeper than usual. The hike began uneventfully, as the golden autumn light seeped through the thinning canopy. But as she ventured further, the woods grew darker, the air colder, and the silence more profound. Gone were the usual rustlings of squirrels or calls of distant birds. Even the sound of her own footsteps seemed muted. The only noise was the occasional creak of trees swaying in the breeze, but there was no wind. It felt wrong, but Alex pressed on, reminding herself that fear had no place in a ranger's job. After an hour, she reached an old, rusty sign marking the closed trailhead. To her shock, the chain meant to block the trail was broken, and fresh footprints led deeper into the forest. She inspected them closely. They weren't human, at least not entirely. The prints looked like a bizarre mix of human and canine, with elongated toes and deep claw marks. She had heard stories from other rangers of cryptid sightings, but no one had ever found evidence this close. She radioed her supervisor, but only static crackled back. Checking her equipment, she frowned. Her radio was in perfect condition. Even her GPS was flickering, losing signal sporadically. Unease gnawed at her, but she felt a professional duty to follow the trail. If someone, or something, was in the woods, she had to investigate. The path twisted, leading her into darker, thicker woods. The trees here were ancient, gnarled, and densely packed, creating a tunnel of shadows that seemed to close in around her. The air was stale, and an overpowering smell like wet fur mixed with rot filled her nostrils. Then she saw it. A head, crouched in the middle of the path, was a figure. At first glance, it looked human, a man huddled and shivering, his back to her. But as she drew closer, she realized his limbs were twisted and elongated, his skin pale and mottled. Before she could react, the figure turned its head, its face a contorted mess of human and animal features. Dark eyes bore into her, hollow and hungry, filled with a kind of malevolent intelligence that sent a chill up her spine. Without thinking, she stumbled backward, heart hammering as she fumbled for her flashlight. She aimed it at the creature, hoping to scare it off, but the light didn't even seem to bother it. Instead, it rose slowly to its full height, Hadar impossibly tall and gaunt, with sinewy muscles rippling under stretched, pallid skin. Its mouth opened, revealing rows of sharp, uneven teeth. In a voice like a low growl mixed with faint human sobbing, it spoke, Why have you come into my woods? Paralyzed by fear, Alex couldn't answer. She could only watch as it took a step forward, then another, its long, clawed fingers reaching toward her. She finally regained her senses, turning to flee down the path. Branches scraped her arms, roots caught at her boots, but she pushed forward, not daring to look back. She reached a small clearing, breathless and shaking, but as she glanced around, her heart sank. The trees looked different, older somehow, and thicker. She didn't recognize this part of the forest, though she'd hiked these trails dozens of times. The creature's low, rumbling voice drifted through the trees again, though there was no sign of it. You cannot leave. She forced herself to move, bolting down what looked like a narrow game trail, praying it would lead her out. But the further she ran, the stranger the forest became. The air grew colder, and strange symbols were carved into the trees, twisted shapes and looping designs that made her head ache to look at. The light was fading, and though she knew it couldn't be more than mid-afternoon, darkness began to swallow the woods. Panic surged through her as she realized she was lost. She tried her radio again, but the static was stronger, an ear-piercing shriek that made her throw it down in pain. And then she heard footsteps, heavy, dragging footsteps, moving just beyond her sight line, circling her. In desperation, Alex scrambled up a steep hill, hoping to get a clearer view of the surrounding forest. But when she reached the top, her blood ran cold. The forest stretched endlessly in all directions, twisted and dark, with no sign of the familiar trailheads or park landmarks. It was as if she'd been transported to another version of the woods, one that had never been touched by sunlight or humanity. A shuffling sound came from behind her, she spun around, and there it was, the creature staring at her with those hollow, empty eyes. It stretched its mouth into a grotesque smile, pointing a long, clawed finger toward her. 
Stay, it whispered, its voice echoing unnaturally. Become one with the forest. Summoning every last ounce of strength, Alex bolted down the hill, running blindly through the woods. She could hear the creature following, its footsteps growing louder, closer, until she felt its breath on the back of her neck. She stumbled, falling into a shallow creek, but the cold water snapped her into focus. She climbed to her feet and, driven by sheer survival instinct, ran faster than she ever had. After what felt like hours, she burst out of the tree line and into the ranger station's parking lot. She collapsed against the side of her truck, gasping for air, her heart pounding. She looked back at the forest, half expecting to see the creature standing at the edge. But the woods were still, silent, and undisturbed. No one believed her story. They chalked it up to exhaustion or a vivid nightmare, but Alex knew what she'd seen. She transferred out of Glacier National Park soon after and never returned. But sometimes on cold, quiet nights, she swore she could still hear that voice in her dreams, whispering from a place beyond the veil, calling her back to the deep, haunted woods. Story number six. Nestled deep in the Rocky Mountains was a stretch of isolated forested land that even the most seasoned rangers rarely visited. Known only as Deadwater Ridge, it was infamous for its perilous terrain and the strange occurrences that had earned it a dark reputation. Only a few people knew the truth about Deadwater Ridge, and Ranger Kate Reynolds was one of them. Kate had spent over a decade working in these woods, but she never patrolled Deadwater Ridge by choice. It was an unspoken rule among the rangers that they stayed clear of the ridge. Too many of her colleagues had gone missing there, or worse, come back with stories that changed them forever. But when two young campers failed to return from the area, Kate didn't hesitate to volunteer for the search. The sun was already beginning to set as she set off into the dense forest, knowing she would have to face whatever horrors awaited her if she hoped to bring them back. As she hiked up the ridge, she felt a creeping sense of unease, the same feeling she'd had every time she had ventured close to dead water. The air was dense and cold, and the trees seemed to close in around her, blocking out the sky. Her radio crackled with static, and she tried calling for backup one last time before realizing there was no signal here, not this deep in the woods. Just as the last light of day faded, Kate found the campsite. The tents were torn, scattered in disarray, their contents strewn across the ground as if by a violent struggle. Shredded sleeping bags, food cans with teeth marks, and even a single blood-stained hiking boot lay near the smoldering remnants of a fire. The sight made her stomach twist. Hello? She called out, her voice swallowed up by the forest. Only silence answered. She turned to examine the trees, her flashlight casting long, eerie shadows. And then she heard it, a faint whisper, drifting on the wind. Kate? She froze, her blood running cold. It had sounded close, like someone whispering right in her ear. But no one was there. Hello, she called again, louder this time. The whisper came again, repeating her name, a drawn-out, desperate sound that made her skin crawl. She backed away from the camp, her heart hammering in her chest, scanning the darkness with her flashlight. The forest felt alive, pressing in closer and closer, as if it had been waiting for her. Suddenly, she caught movement out of the corner of her eye, a figure in the trees, tall and skeletal, with arms that were far too long and legs that bent at unnatural angles. It moved slowly, each step calculated, the branches and underbrush silent beneath its feet. Kate could barely make out its face through the shadows, but she could see enough to know it wasn't human. Its mouth stretched into a wide, unnatural grin, teeth glinting in the faint light. Heart pounding, Kate took a step back, but the figure mirrored her, gliding closer, its grin widening as it watched her struggle to contain her fear. And then, in a voice that was a chilling echo of her own, it whispered, Don't leave. Kate turned and ran, the sound of her footsteps crashing through the forest as she sprinted back down the ridge. But as she ran, she heard another set of footsteps close behind her, matching her pace, echoing her every move. She didn't dare look back. She could feel its presence, sense its twisted grin, and hear its voice echoing through the trees, always just a step behind her. After what felt like hours, Kate stumbled onto a rocky outcropping overlooking a steep ravine. She stopped, panting, her flashlight beam shaking as she tried to steady herself. The footsteps had stopped. She turned, slowly, dreading what she might see. 
There, just at the edge of the tree line, stood the figure, watching her with unblinking eyes. Its face had shifted, mirroring her own features, but twisted and wrong. The creature raised a hand, beckoning her closer with one long, bony finger. Stay, it whispered, in a voice that sounded like her own, but distorted and hollow, as if echoing from some deep, dark place. Come. Home. Kate felt a strange pull, a desire to step forward, to let the creature lead her deeper into the darkness. She shook her head, struggling to resist, but her legs felt like lead, uh, as if something unseen was holding her in place. Then, out of the corner of her eye, she noticed something glinting in the dirt nearby. A small silver locket, half buried in the ground. She knelt, picking it up with trembling fingers, recognizing it instantly. It was the locket that one of the missing campers had been wearing. Clutching it tightly, she felt a surge of clarity and strength return to her, the fog in her mind lifting. With one last look at the creature, she backed away, clutching the locket like a talisman, whispering a prayer under her breath. The figure's grin faltered, and it took a step back as if repelled by the small object in her hand. She took another step back, her gaze never leaving the creature, and then she turned and ran, feeling its angry eyes boring into her back. Kate didn't stop running until she was back at the edge of the forest, where the other rangers were waiting. She stumbled into their arms, breathless and shaking, barely able to get the words out. But the look in her eyes told them everything. They knew, without her saying a word, that she had encountered something that was not meant to be found. The two campers were never seen again, their fate a mystery that would haunt Kate for the rest of her days. She left the ridge soon after, retiring from her job as a ranger and moving far from the Rocky Mountains. But late at night, when she closed her eyes, she would hear that voice again, whispering her name from the dark woods of Deadwater Ridge. Stay, Kate, come back. And sometimes in her dreams, she would see that creature grinning at her with her own face, waiting for her to return. Story number seven. It was the dead of winter in the rugged, isolated wilderness of Olympic National Park. Ranger Jamie Parker was patrolling the park's more remote sectors alone, a task only the most experienced rangers were assigned. Snow blanketed the forest, muting every sound, and the air was sharp, biting at her cheeks as she moved along the trail. This part of the forest, known as Silent Valley, had a dark history. Some claimed the valley was cursed, others said it was haunted. Hikers had gone missing here, only to be found miles away, mumbling incoherently about things in the trees. Jamie, however, prided herself on being rational. In her 10 years of service, she'd heard countless ghost stories from campers, hikers, and even other rangers, but she'd never once encountered anything she couldn't explain. She knew that solitude in the wilderness could play tricks on the mind. Still, something about Silent Valley put her on edge, though she couldn't say why. As dusk began to settle, Jamie turned to head back, but then she noticed something strange, tracks in the snow, they were fresh, leading deeper into the woods and far from any established trails. They were too large and oddly shaped to be any local wildlife. Curious, Jamie decided to follow them. The tracks wove through dense thickets and up rocky slopes, zigzagging as if whoever or whatever had left them was disoriented or hiding. Each step filled Jamie with a deeper sense of unease. The sky darkened and the familiar sounds of the forest faded into an unnatural silence, a suffocating kind of quiet that made her heart beat faster. At last, she reached a small clearing, and in the center, she saw it. A massive, gnarled tree, blackened as though struck by lightning. Around the tree lay strange objects arranged in a crude circle. Animal bones, shredded bits of clothing, and something that looked disturbingly like human hair tied into knots and hung from low branches. Then she noticed the smell. A sickly, metallic stench that clung to the air and turned her stomach. She took a step closer, mesmerized by the scene, and that's when she heard it. A faint whispering sound as if someone were standing right beside her, whispering directly into her ear. Help me. Jamie spun around, but no one was there. The forest was empty, still, and completely silent. She took a shaky breath and reached for her radio, but all she got was a screeching static that quickly gave way to more whispering. Help us, please. Chilled to the bone, Jamie backed away from the clearing, trying to calm herself. The whispering grew louder, more desperate, filling her head until she thought she might scream. Then, as suddenly as it had started, the voices stopped, replaced by the sound of something heavy moving through the trees. 
Peering through the shadows, Jamie's heart skipped a beat. There, half hidden in the tree line, was a figure. It was impossibly tall, with limbs that seemed to stretch out at unnatural angles, its skin pale and corpse-like. Its face was shrouded in darkness, but she could see the glint of sharp, jagged teeth when it opened its mouth. The creature raised a bony finger to its lips, as though telling her to be silent. And then, in a voice that sounded like a chorus of the whispers she'd heard, it spoke, They will take you if you don't leave. Jamie stumbled backward, her breath shallow as she fought the primal urge to run. But the creature didn't move closer. It simply watched her with an unsettling calm. Gathering every ounce of courage she had, Jamie turned and hurried back the way she'd come, glancing over her shoulder now and then, half expecting to see the creature stalking her. But the forest was empty. The tracks in the snow had vanished, and only her own footsteps marked the path back. When she finally returned to the ranger station, Jamie's hands were trembling so badly that she could barely hold her coffee mug. She knew no one would believe her. She could barely believe it herself. She filed her report, omitting certain details and citing strange tracks as her reason for returning early. Over the next few days, she couldn't shake the memory of the creature's whispering voice. She started having nightmares, dreams where she wandered the forest, unable to escape, while faint voices cried out to her from the shadows, calling her deeper into the dark. Months passed, and Jamie transferred out of Olympic National Park. But even in the safety of her new assignment, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched, that something was lurking just beyond the edge of the trees, <laughs> waiting for the right moment to call her back into the haunted woods of Silent Valley. Story number eight. No one went near the Hollow Bend Forest after dark. There were too many strange stories, too many unexplained disappearances. Locals whispered about a cryptid, a creature that moved silently among the trees, something no human should ever encounter and live to tell. But Ranger Mark Holden didn't believe in superstitions. After 10 years on the job, he was convinced that most stories about the forest were just that, stories. But one night, that belief was put to the ultimate test. It was early autumn, and the days were growing shorter. The cool wind whispered through the forest carrying the scent of damp earth and pine. Mark's radio crackled to life around 8 p.m. We've got a report, his supervisor said. A couple of campers went missing near Hollow Creek. Can you check it out? Mark frowned. That section of the forest was deep in restricted territory, well beyond where any campers were allowed. How'd they even get that far? He wondered, but all he said was, on it. He grabbed his flashlight, a shotgun, just in case of wildlife, and climbed into his truck. The ride was rough, the dirt path narrowing with each passing mile. Soon, he had to park the truck and hike the rest of the way. Darkness fell fast in the woods, wrapping everything in shadows. Mark switched on his flashlight and started toward Hollow Creek. The deeper he went, the quieter the forest became. It was the kind of silence that gnawed at you, like every animal had fled to avoid something terrible. The occasional crack of a twig underfoot was the only sound, and Mark's unease grew with every step. He arrived at the creek and immediately spotted signs of the campers. A fire pit, long extinguished with the ashes scattered by the wind. A couple of backpacks, one of them ripped open. And then he saw something that stopped him cold. A footprint, huge, clawed, and unlike anything he'd ever seen. Mark squatted down to inspect it, his pulse quickening. He'd tracked plenty of animals before, but nothing left prints like this. He ran his hand over the edge. It was fresh. Whatever made it was still close. He stood up and scanned the area with his flashlight. Hello, he called, his voice low but steady. Anyone out here? The forest gave no reply. Mark was about to turn back when he heard something, a soft clicking sound, like nails tapping against wood. It came from just beyond the tree line. Slowly, he turned toward the noise, shining his light into the trees. At first, he saw nothing but shadows. And then, it moved. A figure stepped into view. It was tall, easily seven feet or more, and hunched forward as if it barely understood how to stand upright. Its limbs were unnaturally long, with clawed hands that dragged slightly on the ground. The skin was mottled, like the bark of a tree, and its eyes glowed faintly in the beam of Mark's flashlight. The creature tilted its head at an odd angle, studying him. Mark's breath hitched in his throat. It wasn't just watching him, it was waiting. He raised his shotgun slowly, but before he could aim, the creature let out a sound. 
a low rumbling growl that vibrated in Mark's chest. And then it charged. Mark fired blindly, the blast shattering the quiet. The creature darted into the trees with terrifying speed, to hate, vanishing into the shadows as if it had never been there. Mark turned and ran, heart pounding in his ears. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't afraid of him. And now it knew he was here. He sprinted toward the creek, slipping on the wet ground, his flashlight beam bouncing wildly. Somewhere behind him, he heard the creature's clicking steps again. Closer this time, keeping pace with him, but just out of sight. It was playing with him, like a cat with a mouse. Yet Mark burst into a clearing, lungs burning. He knew he couldn't outrun it, not in this darkness. He needed to find a place to hide, and fast. That's when he spotted the old ranger's outpost up ahead. It was a dilapidated structure, long abandoned, but it was better than nothing. He threw himself through the door and slammed it shut, bolting it behind him. For a moment, there was silence, thick and suffocating. Mark leaned against the door, trying to catch his breath. And then, the tapping began. Soft at first, almost polite, like someone knocking to be let inside. Tap, tap, tap. Then it grew louder, more insistent. Thud, thud, thud. Mark backed away from the door, gripping his shotgun tightly. He pointed it at the entrance, sweat dripping down his face. The door shuddered under the weight of something heavy pressing against it. Then, without warning, the tapping stopped. The forest went silent again. Mark held his breath, waiting, every muscle tense. And that's when he heard it. The thing was on the roof. The wooden planks above creaked under its weight as it crawled across the roof. Mark felt panic rising in his chest. He needed to think, to act fast. But before he could move, the roof gave a sharp groan, and then something heavy dropped down in front of the window. It was staring at him. The creature's face pressed against the glass, its glowing eyes locked onto Mark. It grinned, revealing rows of sharp, uneven teeth, and tapped one long claw against the window, once, twice, three times. Mark aimed his shotgun at the window, his finger tightening on the trigger. But before he could fire, the creature vanished again, slipping back into the darkness like a nightmare, fading at dawn. Mark stood there, panting, waiting for it to return. Minutes passed, then an hour. And finally, the first light of morning crept through the trees. He didn't wait any longer. Gripping his shotgun, Mark threw open the door and bolted for the truck. He didn't look back, not even once, until he was safely inside the vehicle, slamming the door shut behind him. As he sped down the dirt road, heart pounding, he realized something chilling. The creature hadn't been trying to get in. It could have broken through that flimsy old door or window at any time. No. Uh, it had been toying with him, letting him know that it could get him any time it wanted. Mark never found the missing campers. Their names were added to the growing list of people who had vanished without a trace in Hollowbend Forest. And after that night, Mark quit his job as a ranger. He moved far away from the woods and never set foot in a forest again. But sometimes in the dead of night, he would lie awake, heart racing, convinced that somewhere out there in the dark, the creature was still watching him, waiting. Because deep down, Mark knew one terrible truth. It had let him go, but next time it wouldn't. Story number nine. In the remote corners of the Pacific Northwest, hidden beneath layers of towering trees and thick underbrush, lay a forest known only as Shadow Grove. This secluded area had gained a reputation for being haunted, a place where whispers carried on the wind and shadows danced in the corners of your vision. Few dared to venture into its depths, but for those who did, the stories of terror and disappearance ran rampant. Park Ranger Eli Thompson had heard them all, but remained skeptical, until he found himself drawn into the darkness of Shadow Grove. One late autumn afternoon, as the sun began to dip behind the mountains, Eli received a call about a series of strange occurrences reported by campers. Flickering lights in the woods, sounds of children laughing, and the unsettling feeling of being watched were all part of the complaints. Though it was almost time to head back to the station, Eli decided to investigate. He couldn't shake the feeling that something was off. As he ventured deeper into the grove, the shadows lengthened, enveloping him in a thick fog that seemed to pulse with an otherworldly energy. The trees loomed like ancient sentinels, their gnarled branches reaching out as if to grasp him. Eli switched on his flashlight, the beam cutting through the mist, illuminating the path ahead. Each step he took was accompanied by the soft crunch of leaves, 
but soon that sound began to fade into an eerie silence. Hello, he called out, hoping to reassure himself that he wasn't alone. His voice echoed back to him, warped and distorted by the shadows. A chill ran down his spine as he felt an inexplicable sense of being watched. He pressed on, but the oppressive silence seemed to swallow him whole. After a few more minutes, he reached a clearing where the campers had set up their tents. But something was wrong. The area was in disarray. Tents lay overturned, and gear was scattered as if there had been a struggle. Eli's heart raced as he began to inspect the scene. The faint scent of smoke lingered in the air, mingling with something foul and acrid. Suddenly, he heard it. Laughter, soft and childlike, floating through the trees. The sound sent a jolt of fear through him. There were no children camping here. With a sense of dread settling in, Eli stepped further into the clearing, scanning the surroundings for any sign of the campers. Is anyone there? He shouted, his voice cracking. The laughter ceased, replaced by an unsettling silence. As he turned to leave, something in the shadows caught his eye, a flicker of light like a candle flame. Without thinking, he followed it deeper into the grove, his instincts pulling him closer. As he approached the light, he entered a small glen, illuminated by what appeared to be several candles arranged in a circle. In the center stood an altar, carved from stone, covered in strange symbols. Eli's heart raced as he took in the scene. It felt wrong, dark, as if he had stumbled into a forgotten ritual ground. And then he heard it again, the laughter, closer now. Eli turned and his blood ran cold. Emerging from the shadows were figures, small and lithe, their skin a sickly shade of gray. Their eyes were wide and unblinking, mouths stretched into exaggerated grins. Eli felt a wave of panic wash over him as he realized they were not human. Join us, one of them whispered, its voice sweet but dripping with malice. Eli turned to run, but as he fled, he heard the sound of tiny footsteps behind him, growing louder and more insistent. The shadows around him shifted, the trees bending in ways that should have been impossible, closing off his escape. He stumbled through the underbrush, desperate to put distance between himself and the creatures. The laughter grew louder, echoing around him, mingling with whispers that seemed to call his name. He felt the presence of the figures close behind, their breath chilling his neck. Just as he thought he might escape, he tripped over a root, sprawling face first into the forest floor. With a surge of adrenaline, Eli pushed himself up, frantically searching for a way out. In the distance, he spotted the faint glow of his flashlight, the way back. He sprinted toward it, ignoring the branches that clawed at him, desperate to escape the nightmare closing in. As he neared the clearing, he turned back to catch one last glimpse of his pursuers. The figures had stopped, standing just beyond the edge of the light, their eyes glimmering with hunger. They tilted their heads in unison, and Eli felt a wave of despair wash over him. Come back, Eli, they called their voices intertwining in a haunting melody. Stay with us. But he refused to succumb. With a final burst of strength, he plunged back into the trees, the flashlight guiding him through the darkness. He pushed himself harder, breaking through the underbrush and finally emerging onto the main trail. Panting heavily, Eli turned to look back, but the grove seemed normal again, the shadows retreating as if nothing had happened. The laughter faded into the distance, leaving only the rustling of leaves in the wind. He stumbled back toward the ranger station, every instinct telling him to leave Shadow Grove behind forever. When he reached the station, he found his fellow rangers waiting, their faces filled with concern. Eli recounted his experience, but his words fell on skeptical ears. They dismissed it as an overactive imagination, attributing it to fatigue and the eerie atmosphere of the grove. But Eli knew the truth. As the days passed, he tried to shake off the memory, but the whispers still echoed in his mind. At night, he could hear them calling, beckoning him back into the shadows. He could feel their eyes on him, waiting for the moment he would return. He never went back to Shadow Grove, but he couldn't escape the feeling that it wasn't done with him. The shadows lingered, and the laughter haunted him in his dreams, a chilling reminder that some places should remain undisturbed, where darkness lurks and horrors are hidden, waiting patiently for their next visitor. Story number 10. The sun was setting over Blackwood Pines, casting long shadows through the towering evergreens of the National Forest. It was late October, and the air was crisp with the scent of fallen leaves and the chill of the approaching winter. 
Ranger Claire Reynolds, a five-year veteran, had spent many evenings in the park. But tonight felt different. The whispers of the forest were louder, almost like an undercurrent buzzing in her ears. Claire had received an emergency call earlier that day. Two hikers had gone missing. The park's layout could be treacherous for the unprepared, especially in this season. As she donned her gear, her supervisor warned her, keep close to the trails and don't go after them alone. The woods can be unforgiving. Don't worry, Claire replied, but unease settled in her stomach. She had heard the stories of strange happenings in Blackwood Pines, shadows darting just out of sight, flickering lights deep in the forest, and whispers that seemed to come from nowhere. With a flashlight in hand, Claire set out along the trail, her breath visible in the cooling air. She called out for the missing hikers, the sound of her voice swallowed by the thickening woods. Minutes turned into an hour, and as she moved deeper into the trees, the shadows stretched ominously. Then she spotted something on the ground, a bright red scarf tangled in the underbrush. Claire's heart raced as she knelt to inspect it. This was definitely one of the hiker's belongings. Hello, she shouted, her voice echoing through the trees. Is anyone there? Silence. As she stood up, she felt it, a cold breeze brushing past her, chilling her to the bone. It was followed by a soft whisper that curled around her, indistinct but unmistakably there. Panic surged as she glanced around, but the trees remained still, cloaked in darkness. She pressed on. Her senses heightened, every snap of a twig making her jump. Then she heard it. A distant cry, a voice calling for help. It was faint but urgent. Help, please. Claire sprinted toward the sound, heart racing, until she came upon a clearing. The moonlight poured through the branches, illuminating a small campsite. The fire pit was cold and empty, the tent unzipped but eerily quiet. She could see signs of a struggle, overturned chairs and scattered gear. A sense of dread washed over her. Hello? Claire called again, her voice trembling. She scanned the trees for movement, but all she found were the shadows. The chilling breeze returned, wrapping around her like a shroud, and then she heard it again, someone crying out. She followed the sound deeper into the forest, pushing through thick underbrush. The cries grew louder, almost desperate now. Help! Please! Help us! As Claire reached the edge of a small ravine, she saw them. Two figures huddled together at the bottom, shivering and dirty. Relief surged through her. I found you, she shouted, crouching down to get a better look. But as she did, she froze. The figures turned toward her, their faces pale and gaunt, eyes wide with fear. You have to get out of here, one of them gasped. It's not safe. What happened? Claire shouted back, but they didn't answer. Instead, they looked past her, horror etched across their faces. She followed their gaze, heart sinking as she saw it. A shape emerging from the darkness, tall and twisted, moving with unnatural grace. It was a creature like nothing she'd ever seen. Its body was elongated, with limbs that twisted at unnatural angles, covered in matted fur and dirt. Its eyes glowed faintly, revealing an intelligence that sent chills down her spine. It opened its mouth, revealing jagged teeth, and let out a bone-chilling shriek that echoed through the trees. Claire's instincts kicked in. Stay back, she yelled to the hikers, but they were already scrambling back, terror driving them to run in the opposite direction. Come back, she shouted, but they disappeared into the darkness. In that moment, Claire was paralyzed by fear. The creature advanced slowly, its eyes fixed on her, the whispering voices swelling around her. Join us, come play. With a jolt, Claire snapped out of her daze and turned to flee, racing back the way she had come. The underbrush snagged at her clothes and branches clawed at her skin, but she didn't stop. The shrieks followed her, mingled with the whispers that taunted her to look back. Don't leave us. Don't go. Desperate for escape, Claire burst into the clearing where she had first found the campsite. The forest was eerily quiet now. The whispers gone, but she didn't slow down. She reached the trailhead and kept running, not stopping until she reached her truck. Panting and shaken, she jumped inside, slamming the door and locking it tight. Heart racing, she looked back toward the woods, but all she could see were the shadows of trees swaying gently in the wind. The creature was gone, but the echoes of the hiker's cries and the whispers lingered in her mind. Days passed and the search team was organized to look for the missing hikers. But when they returned empty-handed, Claire was left with the haunting knowledge that she would never know what happened to them.
She reported everything she saw, but her account was met with skepticism. The stories of the woods persisted, but no one wanted to believe. As the weeks turned to months, Claire tried to move on, but the whispers followed her into her dreams, echoing her failures, taunting her every night. You left us. You left us. Finally, on a particularly cold night, she found herself unable to sleep. A storm raged outside, the wind howling through the trees. It was then she heard it again, the whispers, faint but distinct, seeping through her window. Help us. Help us. Sitting bolt upright, Claire's heart sank. She knew she couldn't escape the forest's call. She had to go back. Pulling on her jacket, she grabbed her flashlight and headed out into the storm, determined to face whatever darkness awaited her. As she stepped into the night, the whispering grew louder, wrapping around her like an old friend. And deep in the shadows of Blackwood Pines, something stirred, waiting for her return. Story number 11. The Lantern Man of Deadwood Forest. Ranger Sam Gibson wasn't afraid of much. In his 25 years patrolling Deadwood Forest, he had encountered everything from wild animals to lost hikers teetering on the edge of cliffs. But what haunted him were the stories, whispers of the Lantern Man. Everyone in town knew the legend. At night, a ghostly figure carrying a lantern would appear deep in the forest, luring people off the trail. Those who followed never came back. Locals said the Lantern Man wasn't human, but something ancient, born from the forest's darkest secrets. Sam had always dismissed these stories. That is, until the night he saw the lantern for himself. It started with a missing boy. Jacob Carter, an 11-year-old, had been camping with his family when he wandered away from the site. By the time his parents noticed he was gone, it was too late. The boy had vanished without a trace. Search teams combed the woods for days, but there was no sign of him. Finally, Sam was called to head the night search in one of the deeper sections of the forest, where even the most experienced hikers dared not go. The boy's family was desperate. Sam knew every minute that passed reduced Jacob's chances of survival. With a flashlight in hand and his radio crackling at his hip, he headed into the thick woods, determined to find the kid. The deeper he went, the more oppressive the forest became. The trees leaned in like they wanted to trap him, and a cold, unnatural breeze drifted through the branches. Sam checked his compass. The needle spun wildly. Something was wrong. Still, he pressed on, calling out the boy's name. Jacob, if you can hear me, call back. Nothing. Only the wind and the crunch of dead leaves beneath his boots. Then, just as he was about to turn back, he saw it. A faint glow in the distance, bobbing gently among the trees like a firefly. At first, Sam thought it was another searcher with a lantern. But when he radioed in, no one answered. Hello? Sam called, shining his flashlight toward the light. The glow flickered, retreating deeper into the forest. Sam hesitated. Something about the light made his skin crawl, but he couldn't shake the thought. What if it was Jacob? What if the boy had found an old lantern and was trying to signal for help? Against his better judgment, Sam followed. The lantern swayed gently, always staying just far enough ahead that he couldn't quite make out the figure holding it. It moved too smoothly, too silently. No sound of footsteps accompanied it, only the faint hiss of wind through the trees. Sam tried to pick up his pace, but no matter how fast he walked, the lantern stayed just out of reach. Then the forest began to change. The trees grew denser and twisted, their branches gnarled like claws. The ground underfoot felt strange, spongy, as if the earth had been soaked in something rotten. A foul odor drifted through the air like decaying leaves and something far worse. Sam's radio crackled to life for a moment, but all he could hear was static and faint, distant laughter. His heart pounded, but he kept moving. The lantern swayed ahead, leading him deeper into the nightmare. Finally, the glow stopped at the edge of a clearing. Sam froze, his breath catching in his throat. There in the center of the clearing stood the lantern man. He was tall, too tall to be human, and his body was a twisted silhouette, cloaked in shadows that rippled like smoke. His face was hidden beneath the hood of a rotting cloak, but the lantern in his hand glowed with an eerie, pale fire. It wasn't warm. It was the kind of cold light that made Sam's skin prickle, like he was standing too close to death itself. And then the figure turned its gaze toward him. Though the Lantern Man had no eyes, Sam felt its attention, sharp and predatory, like a wolf staring at trapped prey. Jacob, 
Sam whispered, his voice barely audible. That's when he saw it. Behind the lantern man, half buried in the dirt, were dozens of human bones. Skulls grinned up at him from shallow graves, their empty sockets staring into nothingness, and among them a small, tattered backpack. Jacob's. Sam's stomach dropped. He knew, without a doubt, that the boy was gone. But the lantern man wasn't done. Slowly, the figure raised its lantern, casting its pale light across the clearing. The shadows twisted and moved like living things, crawling towards Sam. The air grew heavy, suffocating, as if the forest itself wanted to pull him under. Sam stumbled back, fighting the urge to run. The lantern man beckoned with a slow, deliberate gesture, inviting him to step into the clearing. For a moment, Sam's legs moved on their own. The lantern's glow was hypnotic, luring him forward. It promised peace, an end to all struggle, just one step closer and everything would be over. But deep inside, a voice his own screamed at him to stop. With every ounce of willpower, Sam tore his gaze away from the lantern and turned to run. The shadows hissed in frustration, slithering after him, but Sam sprinted toward the tree line, adrenaline pumping through his veins. He didn't stop running until he burst out of the woods and stumbled back onto the main trail. His radio crackled back to life, and the sound of distant voices filled the air, the search team calling his name. Gibson! Come in! Do you copy? Sam gasped for breath, snatching the radio off his belt. I'm here, he wheezed. I'm back on the trail. The relief in the other ranger's voice was palpable. Thank God, we thought we lost you. Sam didn't reply. He glanced back toward the forest. The lantern was gone, but the feeling remained like something was watching him from the shadows, waiting for him to come back. Sam filed his report the next day, leaving out the part about the lantern man and the bones in the clearing. He knew no one would believe him. They'd say he was tired, maybe hallucinating, but he knew the truth. Jacob was gone, just like the others, and the forest had taken him. Sam quit his job soon after, but every now and then, late at night, when the wind howled through the trees and the moon cast eerie shadows on the ground, he would see it again, a faint light, bobbing just beyond the edge of the forest. The lantern man was still out there, waiting for the next lost soul to follow his glow in into the dark, and one day, Sam knew someone would. Story number 12. In the heart of the Appalachian Mountains, there existed a remote forest known as Whistler's Hollow. This place was notorious among the locals for its spine-chilling legends and eerie sightings. The forest was dense, with ancient trees stretching their gnarled branches toward the sky, casting shadows that seemed to breathe and shift with the wind. Few dared to venture into its depths after dark, for it was said that those who did would hear the whispers of the lost, calling them deeper into the woods. Ranger Sam Collins had heard all the stories, but he was a man of science, a believer in facts over folklore. He had patrolled Whistler's Hollow for years and had yet to encounter anything that couldn't be explained. However, when a string of missing persons cases began to stack up in the area, he felt compelled to investigate. One particularly foggy evening, Sam received a call about a group of hikers who had not returned from their trek. With his trusty flashlight and a map in hand, he set off into the thickening fog, determined to bring the missing hikers back safely. As he entered the hollow, the air grew heavy and charged, and a feeling of unease settled over him like a thick blanket. As he followed the main trail, the only sounds were the crunch of leaves underfoot and the distant rustle of the trees. But soon, he began to hear it, the faint sound of whistling, drifting through the branches. It was soft at first, melodic, almost like a lullaby. Sam paused, straining to hear it more clearly. The notes danced in the air, weaving through the trees, drawing him deeper into the woods. Hello? He called out, but the whistling continued, seemingly ignoring him. Sam shook his head, dismissing it as the wind playing tricks. Yet the further he walked, the more the sound enveloped him, growing louder and more insistent. After a while, he reached a small clearing. In the center stood an old cabin, its windows dark and uninviting. The whistling was now clearer, more distinct, and it seemed to be coming from inside the cabin. Sam felt a tingle of apprehension, but was too curious to turn back. He stepped onto the creaking porch, his flashlight flickering ominously. As he pushed open the door, the whistling ceased abruptly, plunging the cabin into an uncomfortable silence. The inside was filled with dust and cobwebs, old furniture covered with white sheets, 
and the unmistakable scent of decay. A chill ran down his spine, but he pressed on, searching for any signs of the missing hikers. Suddenly, he caught sight of a figure in the corner of the room, half hidden in the shadows. It was a woman, her hair tangled and wild, eyes wide with fear. Sam's heart raced as he stepped closer, but the moment he did, she vanished into thin air, leaving nothing but a whisper that echoed through the cabin. Help us. He felt a jolt of panic surge through him. Who's there? He shouted, but the only answer was silence. The air thickened with tension as Sam fumbled with his flashlight, the beam sputtering in and out. He felt an overwhelming urge to leave, to escape whatever haunted the cabin. Just as he turned to flee, the whistling returned, now sinister and distorted, echoing all around him. Shadows began to creep closer, swirling in the corners of his vision. Panic-stricken, Sam bolted for the door, but as he reached for the handle, it slammed shut, trapping him inside. The cabin trembled and the whistling morphed into laughter, childlike and taunting. Sam turned in a frantic circle, his breath quickening. He felt the presence of something behind him, something dark and malicious. He could sense it closing in, as if the very walls were alive, pressing in on him. Let us go, he shouted, desperation creeping into his voice. What do you want? The laughter faded and the cabin fell eerily silent. For a moment, he thought he could escape, but then the shadows pooled at his feet, coiling around his legs like serpents. He stumbled back, feeling the cold touch of the darkness reach for him. Suddenly, the door burst open and Sam dashed out into the night, the fog swirling around him like a living thing. He ran blindly, the whistling growing fainter as he pushed deeper into the woods, branches clawing at his clothes, the ground uneven beneath his feet. But no matter how far he ran, he could still hear the echoes of laughter and the whispers of the lost, beckoning him to return. Finally, he stumbled back to the main trail, gasping for breath as he crashed through the underbrush. He glanced back, half expecting to see the figures pursuing him, but the forest lay quiet. The cabin was gone, swallowed up by the shadows of Whistler's Hollow. As dawn broke, the fog began to lift, and Sam made his way back to the ranger station, shaken but alive. The experience had left an indelible mark on him. He reported the missing hikers, but as time passed, no one could find any trace of them. The search parties returned empty-handed, and the cabin remained a phantom, its existence slipping into the realm of myth. Weeks later, Sam found it hard to shake the feeling that he was being watched. He often heard the whistling when he was alone in the forest, and shadows danced just out of sight. Every time he entered Whistler's Hollow, he could feel the presence of those lost souls, their whispers echoing in his mind. One night, unable to sleep, he found himself drawn to the forest once more, the familiar pull of the whistling guiding him. Against his better judgment, he ventured into the grove, uh, the darkness wrapping around him like a shroud. As he walked, he felt a strange sense of belonging, as if the woods were calling him home. And there, at the edge of a clearing, he spotted the cabin again, its lights flickering like candles. The whistling beckoned him closer, and as he stepped forward, he knew that he had succumbed to the hollow's call, lost among the whispers, forever entwined with the darkness of Whistler's Hollow.